Hello, I'm Stan Stalnaker here with the Transition Forum Online, discussing how we scale up in an age of essentially climate emergency. Joining me now is Mark Brzezinski, who's the founder and CEO of Brzezinski Strategies. He's the former ambassador to Sweden under the Obama administration. And after his time in Sweden, Mark was leading the Obama administration's work on the future of the Arctic. Thank you for joining us today, Mark. Thanks for having me. I would love to get into a conversation today with you about the work that's happening and the work that needs to happen, first of all, on recovery from the pandemic and how that could be connected towards the solutions that we need to find for climate. Do you see a connection between the two? And if so, what is it? I see not only a connection between COVID recovery and the fight against climate change, I see an interdependence between them. If there's anything the coronavirus has shown is that humankind has an unhealthy relationship with nature. And we need a roadmap going forward that creates a better balance, a better harmony. Otherwise, we're gonna face such challenges in the future. I've been super impressed with what the Europeans have put forward in the last month, and especially the head of the EC, Ursula von der Leyen. Her 750 billion euro COVID recovery plan is intrinsically connected to the fight against climate change because how it, it, it proposes to pay for it through a carbon tax, through a, a proposal to have it pay through the plastics uh, industry. I think these are very thoughtful ideas that are pertinent to America's recovery. The challenge is that too few Americans know about it. And it's incumbent on the Europeans to share their ideas and ultimately to help lead global recovery when it comes to what happens after Corona and the future of the fight against climate change. But the Europeans have to lead here. They can't shirk from that. It's very interesting, uh, this idea of European leadership on the global stage when it comes to climate and the fact that we are seeing some movements with this uh, this big sort of roadmap to recovery. Do you think that the U.S. could deploy a similar type of roadmap to recovery uh, in terms of the economy and climate? Absolutely. And I think you saw that in the last decade. I mean, we had a global financial crisis in 2008 and America in collaboration with the rest of the world helped spearhead recovery in a way that was in tune with the fight against climate change. I mean, you have to remember that one of the landmark deals struck in the fight against climate change was that between the United States and China in 2015, in which both sides, the two largest economies in the world, agreed to carbon reduction. That happened during a period of economic rebuilding. So we've already done it. The problem is that there is a leadership vacuum in America now, and it is incumbent on others who care about this to propagate the thesis that there is an inter interdependence between economic recovery and the fight against climate change, and that they are not mutually exclusive. And, and now is definitely the moment to do it because we definitely have this, this crisis underway that needs a, a, a equally large response. Another area that has been very much at the forefront of the climate discussion has been the Arctic. And Mark, I know you have a lot of experience working on the US policy side towards the Arctic. Give us an update on what's happening there and the, the impact that climate change is having on the Arctic and then the geopolitical implications of that. You can see from the news reports that there's a lot happening in the Arctic that's not good. We have reports out of the Arctic in the last week that shows greater warming this year, greater sea ice melt by this time as we go into the summer than practically ever in history. And that's the norm in the Arctic, breaking records all the time in terms of re reducing sea ice and increasing temperatures, melting the permafrost and so forth. Why does that matter? After all, the Arctic is remote and distant. And the answer to that is that the Arctic has local roots, but global reach. 
What happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. It affects all of us in our own backyard. How? Because of coastal erosion, because of rising sea levels, because of more erratic weather patterns, and many other effects that affect us directly. And what is at stake here is nothing less than the kind of world our children and our children's children's inherit. Because the places where most people live in large cities along coasts, by definition, because of the impacts of climate change and what's happening in the Arctic, by definition, those places where most people live are going to contract. And in our children's children's lifetime, we're going to have climate refugees and haves and have nots colliding with each other because of these impacts. That is what is at stake when it comes to the future of the Arctic. And so, Mark, that's very vivid. And it, it does raise the question, you know, we are in an election year in the United States. How important is the executive branch, say the presidency, relative to Congress in terms of being able to get to uh, some kind of action by the United States? The, the reality is, is that many countries in the world are hoping for U.S. leadership on climate, and they haven't been able to find that. And at the same time, the clock is ticking down. In order to stay under the 1.5 degrees Celsius imperative of, of essentially a rise in temperature, we need to do some pretty drastic things, and we need to do them within the next 10 years, which makes this election incredibly important from an executive standpoint uh, in terms of making an impact from a U.S. perspective. How important is the presidency to this relative to Congress, or is this something that can be done outside of essentially executive pressure? That's a great question. How important is the presidency to the future of the Arctic? You have to remember that America is an Arctic country, but we are just one Arctic country. Eight countries are, are around the Arctic and have Arctic areas within their geography. So America is not preponderant in the Arctic. We have to work with others when it comes to decision making in the Arctic. And beyond that, a lot of other countries that are not Arctic countries have a direct interest in the Arctic, whether it's the impacts of climate change or shipping or resource development and, and the like. The, the wonderful thing is that the American presidency has already walked the walk when it comes to developing alignments that are responsible and oriented to the future when it comes to the Arctic. President Obama convened the first ever summit on Arctic science in 2016. And that included, of course, the science ministers of the eight Arctic countries, but also there were 25 governments from around the world that were included in this summit as well, like China, like India, like Korea, like Germany, not Arctic countries, but countries that have shown a serious commitment to the future of the Arctic. And a number of alignments and combinations and agreements were developed from that, that, that summit about science and technology collaboration to understand what's happening in the Arctic. So the fact is, is that in this area that is a shared space for mankind, the Arctic, international combinations are possible, but you have to want to collaborate internationally. We don't have a president who wants to collaborate internationally on anything, let alone the future of the Arctic, and it would be good if we did. Right. Well, very vivid words from you today, Mark. Thank you so much for joining us here at the Transition Forum online. And we look forward to catching you again soon. Where can we find out more about the work you're doing with uh, Brzezinski Strategies? Please go to www.brzezinskistrategies.com to visit my website. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak with you. Thank you, Mark.